Hello and welcome to ADB Insight. I'm Nisha Pele. For the past few decades, the Asia-Pacific region has become a central link in the production of goods and services worldwide. From pharmaceuticals to fashion, IT to automobiles, the region has enjoyed a competitive advantage in so-called global value chains, and it's a magnet for companies looking for a competitive edge. Its strategic position in these global value chains has turbo-boosted Asia's growth, but today they're facing unprecedented challenges. COVID has wrought havoc. Economic lockdowns have displaced workers from factory floors and crippled regional production. An ADB report shows that 90% of GVCs have been impacted by a combination of the pandemic and trade tensions. Now, with vaccination rates rising, the region's economies are slowly coming back to life, but struggling to keep up with the speed of global demand. In short, global value chains and the Asia-Pacific's role within those are at a critical crossroads. Here to unpack the issues is Elisabetta Dentile, an economist with the ADB. First of all, Elisabetta, how does ADB see the role of global value chains in driving economic growth and development in the Asia-Pacific region? We have estimated that between 2005 and 2015, Asia lifted more than 600 million people out of poverty. And the rise of global value chains have a big role to play. This is really the superpower of global value chains. The fact that thanks to the rapidly decreasing costs of moving goods, moving people and moving ideas, it has become possible to decentralize the production process uh, to different places in the world and, and actually achieve cost savings in the process, which is the most incredible thing. Um, I can think of a few important examples in Asia. So the textile industry in Bangladesh is definitely a great example. Uh, you might be wearing a t-shirt made in Bangladesh right now that is made out of uh, cotton grown in the US, which maybe has been taken to Indonesia for processing and then turned into fabric in the People's Republic of China, and then maybe re-exported to Bangladesh for, for cutting and for printing and then from there shipped to stores all over the world, all the way to your closet. So this is the superpower of global value chains. The pandemic has shaken up virtually every aspect of our economies and societies. In what way particularly have GVCs been impacted? Well, I like to refer to the impact of COVID-19 on global value chains as a double whammy. A double whammy because global value chains have been hit hard both uh, when the pandemic started, but also now that we are in the middle of a recovery. At the beginning, there were lockdowns all over the world. So workers could not go to the office. Demand for a lot of products collapsed, whereas demands for other products surged, creating shortages. The most famous example of that would be the shortage of personal protective equipment. But now that we are beginning to recover, we are again observing disruptions in global value chains as there is a massive surge in demand for pretty much anything which is putting a lot of stress on the existing infrastructure and is also putting producers under stress because they just cannot cope with a very high demand. So with COVID having disrupted global value chains so significantly, how do you see their future? What I would like to say is, first of all, the global value chains have demonstrated an exceptional amount of resilience throughout this pandemic. And actually, they have been part of the success story because let's not forget that the vaccine supply chain is the reason why we were able to be vaccinated in the first place and, and gradually go back to a normal life. Uh, the future of global value chain is what we decided to be right here, right now. So the decisions that we make today will affect um, what future global value chains will look like. You can decide to go two ways. One way is 
the talk that we have heard about strategic autonomy and all of that, which means that economies might be tempted to, to, to bring back uh, onshore a lot of the production that they had offshored, uh, taking advantage of global value chains. Uh, but in, that would be a mistake. Um, the way to go would be to uh, make sure that we learn from the logistical challenges that arising from the pandemic, that we strengthen global value chains, that we provide an environment that is safe, peaceful, stable, secure for global value chains to thrive. Uh, you know, you can diversify your suppliers, but that does not necessarily mean that you must go back to producing everything onshore. Indeed. Now, we used to think of GVCs largely in terms of production, actually making goods, but increasingly we're seeing a growth in services as well. So how well placed is the Asia Pacific region in terms of trying to capitalize on that trend? Services are really the new opportunity for Asia and the Pacific. And this has been shown already by economies like India with its ICT revolution, that after the, all these decades still continues to be a major driver of growth in the country. And the Philippines with its business process outsourcing uh, industry that has, again, uh, allowed the Philippines to find uh, suitable jobs for its highly educated English speaking uh, workforce. So you are absolutely right that trading services provides incredible opportunities as digitization increases the amount of services that can be performed without uh, the physical presence of the service provider. Um, so, uh, but it's important for Asia and the Pacific to seize the opportunities provided by trading services by uh, having a labor force that, is, uh, that has the adequate skills uh, to, uh, to, to, to work in these sectors. And also, very importantly, the ICT infrastructure that is required for, for, this, uh, for trading services to thrive. Elisabetta, we've been talking about the many benefits of GVCs, the economic benefits, but how do we make sure that these benefits are really inclusive? Well, GVCs are by themselves uh, inclusive already. Uh, we have already mentioned earlier that uh, uh, specializing in specific tasks along the value chain allows workers that are relatively less skilled to get decent paying jobs. And this is what gets people out of poverty. It is true though, that there is this trend of automation that has been going on for decades and it's not slowing down. Uh, therefore, we must protect workers from automation, uh, possibly displacing them. And we do that by building uh, uh, systems that upskill, reskill, workers to make sure that they can transition to different occupations when automation takes over certain tasks along the production chain. And, and this is also why we need uh, social protection systems for workers, unemployment insurance, and, and, and all kinds of uh, um, uh, policies that support workers in their transition uh, from one uh, occupation to another. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, governments really need to try and again, uh, create a, an environment of stability, of certainty, a, an environment where it's easy to uh, uh, be an entrepreneur and it's easy to do business. Uh, this is what at the end of the day is going to uh, make sure that global value chains stay inclusive. Some measured advice there. Elisabetta, thank you so much for joining us on ADB Insight. Thank you. Indeed, thank you to all of you for joining us for this episode. Until the next time, goodbye.